Hello and welcome to Our UFOs Real with T.L. Keller. This edition of Our UFOs Real is brought to you by the Total Novices Guide Books. I'm T.L. Keller, author and former aerospace engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, British Aerospace, and Douglas Aircraft, among others. On this program, we'll be looking into the myths and realities of unidentified flying objects, what most of us call UFOs. Why do people continue to report sightings of UFOs? Why do they report abductions, crop circles, and other highly strange events? All opinions expressed on this show are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of webtalkradio.net. And by the way, if you're a skeptic, or you've had a UFO experience of your own and would like to appear on this show, at the end of the program, we'll announce how to contact us. So strap yourself in and buckle up. You're in for a ride of your lifetime. We have a great show for you today with our guest, Michael Schratt. Michael Schratt is a military aerospace historian and is also a private pilot. He is formerly a writer and a graphic illustrator for Open Minds magazine. I personally consider, by the way, Open Minds to be the premier UFO magazine on the newsstands. Michael has lectured all over the country on the subject of top secret aircraft and was a guest speaker in 2007 at the world's largest air show, the Oshkosh Air Adventure. Michael has developed a number of personal con contacts, including Air Force pilots, naval personnel, and aerospace engineers who have had a top secret Q security clearance. Now, this is the Q clearance is commonly known as a magic clearance. That's M-A-J-I-C. For those of you who have never heard of this, this is the highest security level. And for those of you who are Googling on the internet, Michael's name is spelled S-C-H-R-A-T-T. -T. We have a great show today. First up is uh, Michael Schrett. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Oh, I'm doing very well, thanks. And yourself? Pretty good, pretty good. Great, great to be with you. I'm delighted that uh, you can uh, be with us. Uh, I'd like to start off with um, one of my favorite subjects and uh, favorite personalities, uh, someone who we sort of share in uh, mutual interest and uh, revere, and sorry for his passing. His name is Ben Rich, uh, the former president of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California. Now, on uh, two previous um, uh, shows, I spoke to uh, Jan Harzan and then on another show to uh, Dr. Uh, Ted Loader, uh, both about Ben Rich. Now, uh, of course, uh, Jan Harzan and I uh, attended a lecture in 1993 at UCLA where uh, Ben Rich, uh, as I say, the former president of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, was to give a uh, historical um description of uh, Lockheed Martin Corporation and uh, the uh, Lockheed uh, Martin. Uh, and during his uh, presentation, um, he said some very startling things. And I know that you have a vast um, set of documentation on Ben Rich, and you've done a lot of personal research uh, with him. And I wanted to just cover some points here that I've been wondering about. Now, during the presentation at UCLA, which is in which was in March 1993, uh, Ben Rich made uh, the statement that um, if if you can imagine it, Lockheed Martin has done it, and I found that uh, quite startling, particularly since he repeated it twice. He asked a question basically. He asked, uh, "How are we going to get to the stars?" And he answered his own question, and he said, we're not going to get there by using rockets and chemical propellants. We're going to have to come up with a totally new technology. And then, uh, shortly after that, he said, Lockheed Martin now has the technology to go to the stars. Now, my point is that um, he made a second presentation at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the same year later in 1993, and I don't know anyone who has any knowledge about it except you. 
Um, can you tell us what your understanding of what he said in uh, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base? I'm just trying to compare the two. A absolutely, Tom. And you know, you you should feel very privileged to be one of the few that actually got to see and hear Ben Rich in person. Very few people have ever done that. I, w I felt unusually privileged, but it was uh, more of a stroke of luck than anything else. Wow, wow. Well, let me, uh, let me start off very quickly, if I may, Tom, to just give you the mindset of what Ben Rich was, was thinking of, of this at the time. And as you stated, you're correct. He was the, the director of the Skunk Works between 1975 and 1991. Um, and then uh, within this uh, New York Times book review of his book, Skunk Works, that he co-authored with Leo Janos, this is a book review done on January 1st, 1995. And I just want to read you two quick quotes here. And this is uh, what uh, Ben wrote in Skunk Works. It says, quote, I would strongly advocate reviews every two years of existing so-called black programs, either to, either to declassify them or eliminate them entirely. Secrecy classifications are a burden to all and horrendously expensive and time consuming. So you can see what, what Ben Rich is thinking about here. And then he goes on to state um, in this review, it says, Mr. Rich further complains that once a program is classified secret, it takes an act of God to declassify it. This is consistent with, with what we've heard before, right, Tom? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Uh, I believe he made that statement at UCLA as well. That, that, sounds, that sounds correct to me. And then he concludes that... Uh, that we should adopt, quote, sunset laws on security by which classification restrictions would be automatically nullified with the passage of time. Uh, and then interesting to note that such provisions were eliminated by the Reagan administration in 1982. So the bottom line and the point we're making here, Tom, is that out of all the top secret classified aircraft researchers in the world that, that have ever been around, and there's really not too many of them. By definition, the, the highest authority was Ben Rich himself, because he actually designed, built, and worked on those programs personally. However, according to Ben's own comments, even he couldn't get access to these classified programs. So if he can't get access to it, then we're talking about extra constitutional things, things that probably the President of the United States does not even have a need to know or have access to. I imagine that's the case. Um, I, I, when I think back, uh, maybe um, President Bush number one is one of the very few uh, presidents to yes. have had uh, detailed knowledge about this program uh, within living memory. Um, my sense is that probably Eisenhower and, and Truman knew something about it as well. But, right. um, you know, uh, you, um, you uh, created a document called Legacy of Classified Aircraft right. uh, in 19, uh, oh no, it was in 2007. And this is a uh, 11 by 17 uh, document with basically uh, diagrams of many of the uh, secret aircraft and spacecraft that have been designed, developed in Palmdale, and then uh, tested out in Nevada. And in one box here, it says that this was a quote from the wright Patterson Air Force presentation by Ben Rich in 1993. And the quote is, the Air Force has just given us a contract to take E.T. back home. That, now, that now, is absolutely correct, Tom, and you can bank on that. Um, I did put together a, a list of Ben Rich quotes uh, that I've been able to compile over the years. I stand by these 100%. I've vetted these. Um, anyone is more than more than willing to uh, to verify these if they wish. They they can certainly check these out. It, it may it may pay to just run through some of these. What do you think? Yes, uh, let's do that. Uh, okay, let's let's do that. Like I say. Um, uh, I'm. You're the only one that I personally know who has uh, some inside knowledge of what transpired at Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, later that year. Well, and by the way, before sure. you start, let me just say this: um, some people might say, a skeptic might say, "Well, gee, you know, he was just joking." 
Well, this this gentleman was far from joking. He was absolutely serious. And also, I might point out that uh, he uh, was actually dying of cancer. Uh, and he died of cancer, I believe, in early 95. Is that right? That's correct. That is correct. Uh, so uh, at, at UCLA, my sense and Jan Harzan's sense was that this gentleman was just wanting, uh, bursting with knowledge, and he wanted to let people know, as uh, to whatever extent he could, given uh, secret, uh, national security limitations, he wanted people to know what was going on. And uh, Jan and I certainly got the message, and a lot of others did too. So why don't you go ahead, uh, Michael, and proceed with what uh, you understand to him to have said at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Love to do it, Tom. Love to do it. Now, the subheading for this document, and uh, I'm more than happy to provide this to anyone who might be interested, uh, totally free of charge, because that's what I feel. You know, we paid for these things. Uh, we we actually own a significant portion of these. So, uh, the subheading here is significant statements made by Ben Rich, specifically pertaining to advanced propulsion uh, slash space travel. Former head of Lockheed Skunk Works, 1975 to 1991. Okay, the first one here is quote, we did the F-104, the C-130, the U-2, SR-71, F-117, and many other programs that I can't talk about. We are still working very hard. I just can't tell you what we're doing. So this is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base slide presentation, September 22nd, 1992. And what's interesting about this, Tom, is our tax dollars paid for Ben Rich to give that presentation at Wright Patterson Air Force Space Museum at that time. And if you contact the Public Affairs um, Audiovisual Media de Department of the Air Force Museum, they will provide you with a copy of that presentation free of charge. Okay. I'd like to uh, get yes. a copy of that myself and maybe even broadcast right. it on this show. <laughs> that's, now, that's interesting. You mentioned uh, 1992. Uh, yes, it it was September 22nd, 1992, when that presentation was done at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Oh, I see. Okay. So the UCLA yes. then was actually the second one. Uh, yes, it was there, there, were, there were at least two. There were at least two presentations. Um, it's believed that they were the identical slide presentation um, oh, from okay. what both you and Jan have stated to me plus from the copy that I got from Mike Pedersen Air Force. It's, uh, I believe it's the identical slide presentation. He made some of the very same comments. Some of them may have been a little bit different worded, but it's generally the, the same type of information. Now, the second one is, is identical to what you said. Quote, the Air Force has just given us a contract to take ET back home. This was the last statement that Ben Rich made before the conclusion of his slide presentation. And interesting to note, the last slide that was shown on this presentation was a uh, a black flying saucer tilted at a 45 degree angle, like departing the slide. And he just popped this statement out of kind of nowhere, and you know people people kind of joked at it, um, thinking that this was just a funny way to end the presentation. I wonder, Tom, if if there was more to it it seems like there might have been an encrypted symbolic message indicating yet that, yes, Lockheed Skunk Works has made a propulsion system breakthrough through multiple billions of dollars of you know, military industrial complex black budget funding. They were able to make that breakthrough. So I think there may have been more to that statement than meets the eye. Oh, I agree. Um, my recollection at UCLA, UCLA was that when he showed this artist uh, um, um, drawing uh, he, after that he said and who knows what Lockheed Martin will be working on next yeah. uh, so it it was it was pretty clear and then of course uh, my friend Jan Harzan uh, was able to uh, catch up with um, Ben Rich as he was going through the exit door and wow. he said uh, Jan Harzan asked uh, Ben Rich how do UFOs work and then uh, Ben Rich said, well, how does ESP work? And then Jan came back sort of stumbling, and he said, everything in the universe is connected. That's how ESP works. And then Ben Rich said, that's how UFOs work. 
So, okay. you know, that's that's okay. something that probably, I'm sure, obviously didn't happen uh, at Wright-Patterson. What else did um, Benridge say at uh, sure, sure. Wright-Patterson? I want, I want to fire off the next three relatively quickly because they're okay. all part of the same uh, quantity of, of topics here. Um, now, the next one is UCLA, UCLA School of Engineering Alumni Speech 32393. Um, we now have the technology to take ET back home. And then he said, quote, we now know how to travel to the stars. And then he said, quote, there is an error in the equations, and we have figured it out, and now know how to travel to the stars, and it won't take a lifetime to do it. Think about the implications of what that means, Tom. This is consistent with what you told me, that Ben stated that there were legions of theoretical mathematicians being hired at the Skunk Works. Yes, I'm thinking, right. why would that be the case? <laughs> why would you need a theoretical mathematician you know, at, a, at an aerospace plant? Um, are they working on calculations for star travel? That's what it sounds like to me, Tom. Of course. Of course, yes. that was that was the uh, interpretation that both Jan and, and I had, and obviously you have the same the same Correct. interpretation. Okay, and then he also went on um, at the same UCLA alumni speech three twenty three ninety three quote It is time to end all secrecy on this whatever this is, as it no longer poses a national security threat, and make the technology available for use in the private sector. So, I think the this that Ben is talking about, is this so-called trump card technology that we've heard about and the the political impact that this technology could have on the oil cartels, the, uh, the energy manufacturing plants, we could be free of these. We could be completely liberated. And Ben Rich knew that that could take the place if they could get it to trickle down to the private sector. Yes. Now, Absolutely. Now, this is um, sort of an inside terminology, is it not? Trump card? Uh, what did you use? You said uh, Trump card technologies. Yeah, uh, what, what Trump card technologies exactly? are technologies that change the way that generals feel about fighting a war. It's a completely revolutionary type technology that gives you a quantum leap over your enemy. For instance, sea launch ballistic missiles, um, stealth technology, low observable technology, the atomic bomb, these are trump card technologies. But specifically what we're talking about here is the things that were designed and built and test flown at the, uh, at the Skunk Works in Burbank and then later on at um, the remote test site in Nevada. Those type technologies would give a general you know, a much more power projection technology, and they could definitely have a, a quantum leap over any enemy. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Absolutely. I um, don't know if you've seen this video. Um, it's uh, Jim Goodall. Uh, yes. It's um, if you um, go to the internet and uh, just uh, input uh, Ben Rich, there is a short uh, video. A recording of Jim Goodall that's presented, and Jim uh, was apparently a very good friend of uh, Ben Rich, and my guess is he probably saw him during the last few days of his life. Uh, but um, Jim Goodall goes on to say that uh, Ben Rich told him that there were things out in the desert that were 50 years beyond anything that Jim Goodall could imagine. Hmm. Have you seen that uh, video? I, I have seen that video, and I have spoken to Jim Goodall personally about that. And in fact, um, here's another interesting point for a uh, listening audience, which I just discovered about a year and a half ago. Ben Rich donated his papers to the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. There are about 15 boxes of original Lockheed Skunk Works documentation, photos, diagrams, drawings, illustrations. Um, there's a lot of information there. One thing that I felt was a little bit disappointing, though, is that access to that collection is very difficult to get to. Um, according to their specifications, you need to be an accredited and published aviation historian, and you need two letters of recommendation 
So I had to literally get that um, documentation in line from the um, Society of Air Racing Historians and the American Aviation Historical Society. I was able to get access to the collection. They do not allow you to personally make copies of anything. They don't allow you to uh, scan anything. Everything has to go through the Huntington Library. So I have to be completely honest. It is a very unuser friendly environment. <laughs> and the copies are very expensive. So over a period of two days, um, I was successful of, of going through all of the material there. And there are some really interesting um, early photos of Ben. Um, they have his retirement ceremony there as well. Uh, interesting side point. Um, from all indications, it appears that on the night of January 15, 1991, when the F-117s were making the original sorties uh, at Baghdad, the very same night that was going on, Ben Rich was having his retirement ceremony, and there are you know, letters of well-wishing to Ben that are included in this collection. I was able to copy that, and a whole series of radio interviews that I don't think have ever been heard of, those are also there as well. So this is available to the general public. Um, if you care to do any serious research and you want to go through the hoops to get there, it, it is available. So I just wanted to make that a point as well. Okay, very good. On that uh, video that starts off with the Jim Goodall um, uh, talk, um, eventually they get into a lot of text, and they quoted some things that I wrote myself for the MUFON Journal back in 2010. But um, they say they also said things that certainly didn't come from me, and it's as if Ben Rich had said that uh, we received um, certain technologies from crashed extraterrestrial craft, and and it's using the word quotes they said and from hand-me-downs. In other words, as if Ben Rich had used the word hand-me-down. Do you know anything about that at all? I I have heard those stories as well. Um, I have not been able to confirm that Ben actually made that statement. I have okay. heard those stories as well, and I will not put it on my list until I can pin it down. So right, I understand. right now I just I just can't verify that. But just to back up very briefly what you were talking about with Jim Goodall, um, let me reference an article published in the Vancouver Sun um, on September 29th, 1992, they had a, a very interesting article titled Skunk Works, subtitled, The Evidence Stacks Up to a Near Certainty that a Revolutionary Step Has Been Made in Aircraft Design. This is exactly what Ben Rich was talking about. And then just to back up with what you were saying about Jim Goodall, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct, Tom. Jim Goodall was a very good friend of Ben Rich. They had met multiple times and kicked around the feasibility of of doing a non-holds-barred interview once and for all where Ben would sit down, just him and Jim Goodall in a room with the videotape rolling, and then essentially Ben would let it all hang out and spill the beans. Um, and it actually was agreed upon. Uh, ben Rich did agree to do this, and uh, Jim uh, wrote a letter to Ben describing this whole thing and he said, stated, Ben, if, if I don't take the initiative to do this, as in vet these projects out and, and get your final word on this for some of these programs, who will? Because it's just going to be lost to history. That particular letter is in the collection at the Huntington Library. And this is what, uh, this is what Jim, Jim Goodall was able to procure from Ben Rich just before he passed away on January 5th, 1995. Now, the interview never took place, but Jim was successful in getting a last phone call into the hospital to Ben Rich before he passed away. Now, this is what uh, Ben Rich told Jim Goodall. It says, quote, Jim, we have things out in the desert that are 50 years beyond what you could possibly comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. Yeah. So uh, there you know. go right there. I mean, no. you're, you're talking about the highest authority, practically one of the highest authorities within military classified unacknowledged special access programs 
talking about technologies that are 50 years beyond what we can even dream of, I think it's a done deal. We've we've done it. They have made the breakthrough. They have they have made the quantum leap. Anything that you see out at your public Air Force displays or air shows, we're talking about F one seventeen, B two, F twenty two, it's 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 dinosaur technology. Yes, of course they're, it is. They're so far advanced that you can't even dream of it. Right. Um, Michael, I'd like you to stand by. Uh, our conversation continues uh, in a moment. T.L. Keller's Our UFOs Real is brought to you by the Total Novices Guidebooks. Would you like to know more about UFOs but are afraid to ask? Why do so many people still report UFO sightings? Why are they even here? A new book, The Total Novices Guide to UFOs, introduces the reader to the world of unidentified flying objects. You may have accepted the stories of weather balloons, hoaxes and optical illusions as the explanation of the UFO phenomenon, but just take a look at The Total Novices Guide to UFOs and your worldview will change. This large format book is printed in full colour with more than 500 pages of fascinating reports of UFO crashes, ET abductions, crop circles, and UFO-related stories, including the testimonies of 10 military officers who experienced UFO events and extraterrestrial beings. The Total Novices Guide to UFOs also explains why they are here and who pilots them. The Total Novices Guide to UFOs is jam-packed with stories and reports from well-known UFO researchers such as Linda Moulton Howe, Timothy Good, Stephen Greer, Travis Walton, NASA astronauts Edgar Mitchell and Gordon Cooper. The Total Novices Guide to UFOs is available on the internet from the totalnovicesguide.com, amazon.com or from your local bookseller. Okay, and now we're back with Michael Schratt. Um, of course, uh, if if you if you read into what he said and do the kind of research that you've done, you you come to the the conclusion that they have been building these anti gravity technology devices for over sixty years or so, and you know speaking as a as an aerospace engineer, a former aerospace engineer, I can tell tell you that you know engineers given the time and given the money will not simply develop a technology and put it up on the shelf they'll want to use right. it. And so, to me, the only thing that makes sense is that 19 years ago or more, we had this technology and it worked and it had been perfected. And my sense is they must have used it. I'm um, sure they did. Yeah. Some um, some folks who claim to have seen uh, the um, alien, what was called the ARV, the uh, Alien Reproduction Vehicle, or sometimes called the Flux Liner, uh, these folks who, who have seen it uh, in operation claim that it was fairly beat up as if it had been used rather extensively. And this one was about uh, 25 feet in diameter. And in fact, it is uh, on uh, your document here, Legacy of Classified Aircraft, as an ARV, uh, the flux liner. Uh, now, this was built supposedly or allegedly by uh, Boeing and uh, McDonnell Douglas. Is that correct? Uh, well, let, let me, uh, if I may, Tom, just uh, finish up with two final quotes from Ben. Okay. And uh, we can certainly okay. uh, yeah, jump onto the thing here. Um, now, this one, next one comes from Stuart F. Brown, who is another very good aviation researcher. He was a friend of Ben Rich as well. This is published in Popular Science, October 1994, so I want to document where I'm getting this information. I'm just not pulling it out. Here it says, this has been, quote, we have some new things. We are not stagnating. What we are doing is updating ourselves without advertising. There are some new programs, and there are certain things, some of them 20 or 30 years old, that are still breakthroughs and appropriate to keep quiet about. Other people don't have them yet, end quote. So there's another one of these comments uh, some of these things are 20 to 30 years old, and yet they're still breakthroughs. So, again, uh, these technologies have not been able to allowed to be trickled down to the commercial industry for the benefit of, of uh, the common person. The next one, AIAA lecture, um, Atlanta, Georgia, September 7, 1988. Ben Rich, quote, I wish I could tell you about the projects we are currently working on. 
They are both fascinating and fantastic. They call for technologies once only dreamed of by science fiction writers. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's it. That's that pretty it. well says it all, doesn't it? That says it. That says it. <laughs> so that's just kind of a brief thumbnail sketch of, of some of the comments made by Ben Rich. I personally am, am in agreement with you, Tom, that uh, Ben Rich was a team player. We talked about before how he wanted to let the F-117 to be declassified months or perhaps even years earlier than it was so that the engineers who worked on the program could receive the proper credit that they were due. So he was really trying to help things along, but he was blocked by government bureaucracy and just the nature of black program classifications. Yes, and what's called national security. Right. You know, it's, it's something that uh, I remember quite clearly. Um, when Ben Rich came out, uh, when he first came out onto the uh, the stage at uh, UCLA in 1993, one of the first words out of his mouth was that he recognized certain people within the audience as being from the CIA. And he said, don't ask me about the Aurora Project because I can't say anything. And if I did, I would be sent to Fort Leavenworth. Yes. So, you know, he was quite serious about this. And so there were there were some things that he could say and a lot that he couldn't say. But he he said enough for the message to get through to a lot of people. And I, right. I just I just personally, I just feel fortunate that um, that I have been able to pass uh, pass along some of this uh, to as many people as possible. Uh, it was such a, a ground shaking day for me. It just confirmed all of my personal opinion since I was about eight or nine years old. <laughs> oh, a absolutely, uh, Tom. And you'll recall that researcher Richard Dolan, in his recent presentation in uh, California, Los Angeles area in July, stated that uh, upwards of 50% of government documents are classified top secret. Thereby default, that means that we have essentially lost 50% of our own history I mean, it's just staggering what the government classifies as top secret. We don't even know we're the ones living in the dream world. Yes. It's, it's not them. We're, we're out here thinking that this is uh -huh. our history, and, and the world that we see around us is the actual world. Right. In point of fact, that's not correct. The that's... people who work on these USAP programs, they're living in the actual world. We're the ones that are mistaken, thinking that this is... All we've got, you know, yes, but they've course. got things that are, are so far beyond, you know. Yes, and think, uh, Michael, about what we're all, and when I say all, I mean all of mankind is missing in not right. having uh, some of this technology brought forward so that other, uh, everyone in the world could benefit from it. It's a sad state of affairs. It, it is a sad state of affairs. I mean, just like taking a commercial airliner from New York City to Los Angeles, you know, you're, you're just chugging along in a 747, maybe 500 miles an hour. It's just going to take you hours to get across the country. Now, if we're to believe what Ben states, uh, we could probably get there in, in, in minutes, you know, yes. just a matter of, of a few minutes. Right. And That's, that technology, uh, it's unknown whether it will ever be declassified within the foreseeable future. It, it doesn't appear that it will be the case because a lot of these technologies are no longer classified, but they're proprietary, which makes them independent and exempt from Freedom of Information Act requests. Yes, very much so. You know, Michael, I'm unfortunately going to have to uh, wind up this show today. Sure. But I would like to have you back on a future show, and I'd like to talk about the S-4 facility, okay. which is about 10 to 12 miles south of Area 51 in Nevada. We Absolutely. have a lot to talk about on that one, too. Love to do it. Okay. Thanks again, Michael, for uh, being with us today. Thanks, Tom. All right. Bye now. Take care. Bye. Well, as you can see, Michael Schratt and I are in complete agreement on the following issues. Number one. There are actually two parallel American space programs, the White Space Program and the Black Space Program. The White Space Program is the former Space Shuttle, the International Space Station, and the Mars Rovers. The Black uh, Space Program is exactly what we've been talking about today. 
The U.S. military recovered crashed extraterrestrial craft and were also given what Ben Rich referred to as hand-me-downs. And thirdly, Ben Rich had a very close friend by the name of Jim Goodall, an aircraft restorer, museum curator, and author. They apparently had agreed to create and release a video acknowledging the existence of UFOs, both ours and theirs. Ben Rich died of cancer in early 1995 before it could be recorded. Well, that winds up our uh, show for today. Are you a skeptic or have you had your own UFO experience? For those of you who would like to appear on Are UFOs Real, please contact us at tkeller at dc.rr.com. Thanks for tuning in and staying tuned. We hope this and future shows will truly be mind-opening.